Okay. I'd like to welcome you, Sam. Uh, Sam McLean now, but was Bailey uh, yeah. when you played your rugby league days to the Women in Rugby League Project Life with the Lionesses. Um, really excited to have you on and thank you so much for being interviewed. I'm just so looking forward to this interview. I, I love all of them, but I know you've just got such a rich history as well in the sport <laughs> and what you've done. So I'm really, really looking forward to sort of hearing your memories. Uh, but I can't be remiss without sort of saying that you were in three of the games that we were, uh, the, the, work, the series that we're talking about. So you were in the 2000 World Series. 2002, you did your tour to Australia, and 2003, you were in the World Cup in New Zealand. So you've got some tales to tell. <laughs> and also, as you've moved on, which we'll talk out a bit later about, you know, the Britain's strongest woman, senior woman in, in 2021, um, and also seventh in the world, strongest yeah. uh, woman stroke man. So absolutely fascinating where sort of your rugby league journey took you to eventually <laughs> doing that. So thank you again. So just want to start with really how did you get involved you know where were you born how did you get involved in rugby league uh playing rugby league uh, and everything around that really yeah so i'm uh, from rotherham and i still live in rotherham now uh in south yorkshire so the, the very bottom of traditional rugby league territory some might say um still in god's country though in yorkshire um and i used to watch uh, the sheffield eagles men's team with my brother and my dad uh we'd go to all the away games we'd have season tickets and it was actually a friend of mine Vicky Brooks who was a few years older than me at school uh, she came up to me one day um, in the yard and said you know we've got a women's team in Sheffield and we're doing the whole recruit a friend thing like you do over the summer to bump up numbers and uh, you know when I've seen you at the games do you want to come and have a, um, a try and give it a go rugby league and obviously at that time I was 13 and it was the women's league uh, but uh, yeah, I thought, well, I've always been more of a doer than a watcher. And so I thought, yeah, I'll give it a go. And that's where it started down at, at Sheffield in Hillsborough um, as a sort of a, a 13, 14 year old girl playing in the women's league. <laughs> wow. And it, there was no girls rugby then, was there? So that's Not the only option you no. had. Yeah, 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 we didn't have a girl. Well, we, we didn't have a girls team in Sheffield at the time. We had one previously, but we didn't have enough interest. So, yeah, at the age of sort of 13, 14, I was straight into the uh, the women's league. Yeah. And what year would that have been, Sam? So it was the 94, 95 season, I think, was my first yeah. season. Yeah, yeah. So a bit of a baptism of fire play. And what sort of teams did you play then yeah, when yeah. you were? Can you remember any of them? Yeah, so I think our, the biggest rivals we had that year um, were York Ladies. Um, and they they comprehensively beat us, actually, I have to say, in, in two league games. But we were really competitive and quite, you know, uh, high up the table for the others. And we actually got to the second division cup final that year, uh, which was played as a double header with the first division cup final. And we got to 6-4 at half time. And we were just over the moon, you know, we'd put in a massive performance. They'd hammered us in every league game. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were going downhill in the second half. Uh, sorry, uphill in the second half, downhill in the first half. And they did run away with it a little bit. But yeah, really great game. Yeah, Was that in the dreaded Batley ground or anything like that? Or was it, or was it in... I can't in remember Hillsborough. exactly which... Well, it, it was, it might have been Batley. I remember it was one yeah. of those... Uh, Fable pitches where it was like it sounds up. like badly. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really dry and everyone had grazes on their knees and uh <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant day. So how did you get into Great Britain then? What what happened with that and um your initial debut and things like that? So in nineteen ninety-eight I was invited to the the Academy uh squad that had just been uh, sort of reformed, I think reformed. Um, so it was under 19s at the time, and I was selected into that squad in 1998 and 1999 to play against the England students. And I think we played in the BNFL Cup final curtain raiser um, and won quite convincingly. Um, I have to say, I think it was like 50 points to 14 or something like that. Uh, and I was actually honoured to captain that game. Uh, so first sort of taste of representative honours uh, as a junior and, and captain the squad. I think I may have also been the goal kicker, which if anyone's seen my goal kicking just shows that we didn't have that many great goal kickers in our squad at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, that was a really sort of great honour. And it, I think it really showed sort of the strength of the girls coming through because obviously the students, England students team, uh, were probably students who come to, uh, to university, decided to give 
rugby league ago, whereas we were these battle hardened young women who were playing in the women's league. And so I think that sort of grit and determination, the week in week out of club rugby really showed through uh, when we played the English students. And so it was from there, um, I think it was in uh, 1999 in, uh, that I got a letter, an old fashioned letter, because um, that's the way we did it back then. And I remember getting the post, I had no idea the letter was coming and I opened it and it was from Jackie Sheldon, head coach of Great Britain. And she invited me into the training squad for the World Series 2000s. So I just sat on the stairs in our hall in complete shock and disbelief. Um, it's something I've worked for since I first started playing rugby. I've always been one of those people who wants to do be the best version of me and do the best that I can. Uh, so that was always a goal. And so to get into the squad, at least to train for the World Series 2000 was a massive honor. Really excited and um, yeah, in a little bit of shock, but also knowing how much hard work mentally and physically that would be to then try and get into the squad to compete in the World Series. Oh, wow, that gave me goosebumps, just that. You're getting the letter <laughs> through uh, and yeah. your feelings about that and the excitement of it. Uh, so you had quite, um, you know, sort of from being 13, so it w- would you have been 18, 19 then when you got the yeah, call up? Yeah, um, And quite, as you say, playing in Women's Rugby League, you would have, you know, although I don't, you know, obviously it's better you play within your age, old age groups, as you say, you, you develop to players a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, and that call up. So what was it like? Um, what did your family and friends feel like then when you were called up? Yeah, it was a strange one. I think um, they, they were, it was that kind of thing of, oh, well, well done, Sam. You know, they were all really happy and celebrated, but it was kind of like, I don't think they really understood, you know, what it was in terms of the hard work that they needed to follow and the commitment yeah. and the, you know, driving to Hadgate and Warrington and getting lost on every turn that me and... Um, Becky Stevens at the time were uh, were taking we it was before sat navs as well so I remember we used to go to those uh, <laughs> those uh, training sessions and we'd recognize the route but it was the wrong route because we'd memorized the wrong route and they're like yes I recognize this this must be the right way no this is where we turn around and go back because we've gone the wrong way because we didn't have sat navs back then either um so that was great because obviously I knew a couple of people who were there Becky particularly um from Sheffield and uh, but yeah my, my ex- sort of family and, and friends who weren't involved so much in rugby didn't probably really grasp what it was about but were just you know very proud of me obviously national representation uh, yeah yeah tell me a bit more about the sort of the preparation then for the well says what what were you expected to do as a player in preparation off so the field had, really? uh, on, yeah. you know, in, ready for playing yeah well we had lots of um, obviously training days we had training weekends as well um, and uh, obviously that was to go through the tactical stuff, work on technique and work on team planning. But we also obviously had um, sort of strict sort of training schedules in the gym. Uh, I think Simon Worsnot was around then. I know he certainly was on board much more uh, in the later tours. Uh, and he also, you know, set our conditioning programs. It wasn't just in the gym. It was also um, off, you know, on the track and things doing sort of uh, the more cardio and also the sprints and aerobic and aerobic fitness you know for rugby you need kind of everything the strength the uh, speed the endurance um, and he set together a really great program for us and that was a lot of hard work but that was the kind of thing I really enjoyed so I enjoyed getting out there and training uh, and putting in the sort of the hard work in the gym as we'll probably allude to later followed through throughout my life um, and then we had the dreaded fitness test that we had to do, uh, the five minute run. How far can you go in five minutes while well, without trying to lose the will to live um, or, you know, lose your lungs um, and then max weight test and things as well. So there was also some mental preparation that we did. It was more limited back then. Obviously, we were really hampered by funding and uh, we fundraised all our own uh, funds to go these places. And so. Uh, we did briefly have a psychologist on board with us who did a couple of sessions with us, um, but unfortunately we weren't able to sort of keep that in place just because of a, a lack of resources at the time. So yeah, lots lots of different aspects. And also, as I say, a big part of the preparation was earning enough money to get to the event. Now the World Series was okay because that was uh, in, you know, the tropical location of Wigan, on just near Wigan. Um, but, uh, you know, subsequent tours were the other side of the world. Yeah, so you had to raise your funds for right throughout all the tours. 
yeah um, yeah yeah and at the time I was just a, I was a university student so I, I wasn't exactly on a on a high wage as uh but I just sort of set money aside sort of each month and sort of paid it off almost I think it was a standing order or something I set oh, up with wow. the pay off each month to make to the full amount I didn't have any sponsorship or anything like that at the time um and I remember you know doing the bucket collections which was character building we always called it character building yeah tell me a bit more about that these bucket collections oh they were a fantastic way to raise money and you know we bring you know as many people were available to go to one of the the men's um rugby league professional games so I know we went to a world cup I remember it was all cram, cramming into a, a minivan to go to the challenge cup sorry in I think it was in Edinburgh one year and uh, we'd have our Great Britain shirts on and or track suits and we'd just be like you know give us some money um, and literally, literally shaking buckets at people the fans as they were coming in um, I always remember before uh, the 2002 tour to Australia we decided to try a very clever tactic in, in rugby league terms. Give us some money to beat the Aussies. And literally all of these uh, rugby league fans like, I'll give you some money to beat the Aussies. And we're like throwing money in the in the bucket. We're like, yeah, that's a great cause. Go out there and beat the Aussies, lasses. Um, so again, it was team building, character building. Um, just a shame that, you know, we at the time we didn't have the, the support to, to not have to do that. Although in, a, in and of itself, it probably added something, I think. Yeah. The camaraderie and the team building and the, oh, the mental fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Particularly some of the comments I imagine you got about being women rugby league players. Actually, I mean, to be fair, the fans were really supportive. And uh, I do remember one game we were sort of, we'd got into the stadium and we were sort of going up and down the stands. And we had our shirts on that have our names on the back at the time. And uh, they just, randomly this section of, of fans just started a chorus of um there's only one Bailey and Stevens because they could just see our, our shirt names and so they just started chanting our names for no apparent reason and everyone oh, you know, everyone you went past you know whether it was a you know a few pence or a few pounds they, they'd dig into their pocket and, and throw something in so actually you know in that sense it, it was a, a nice experience because it was it was really nice that rugby league community coming mm -hmm. together uh, for us so yeah that was really good oh that's really lovely memories <laughs> I like that oh wow the brills aren't they our rugby league fans yeah rugby league fans amazing. yeah oh that's fantastic so tell us then you get selected um to play for the World series uh and you're getting in preparing ready for uh, and it was on home territory so you were in yeah. the UK with the rugby league world cup so tell us a bit more about that and um on and off the field really what what went on yeah so I uh, again I got my letter in May 2000 um but you know I mean that, that's an awful thing it's not even an email it was just a letter you're sat waiting for the postman to arrive to see if you've been selected into the squad to compete in the world series my first you know potential world world cup type event and our, our post came at sort of one, two in the afternoon. So some people had got their post early. A few of the, the women were posties themselves. So I think they got their letters very early on. Uh, and we were just literally waiting for the postman to arrive because you knew when the letters would come. And uh, sure enough, I got my letter. I still have it to this day. I have all oh, my, my letters. Um, and I'd been selected into the uh, the squad to, to compete in the World Series, which was amazing. Um, as I say, we were based in, in, the, in an exotic hotel in Oral near Wigan. And I remember that November being really, really wet. I think we had lots and lots of flooding. We had to change venues for one of the games, at least one of the games. And it was just a very soggy, soggy time. Um, you know, wearing all the, the, obviously we prepared well, we had the, uh, the waterproofs and everything. And I remember the Aussies coming over and I remember I think, it, I don't know if it was the tour manager for the Aussies saying, um, you know, that, that her mother had always lied to her because she said that the, the clouds kept the heat in. Uh, <laughs> it's like obviously not true in, in the UK. Um, and yeah, it was it was really such an amazing experience. I mean, it was my 20th birthday while we were uh, in the World Cup. So, uh, you know, the girls got me a birthday card. I've still got that as well. Um, and that was really cool. Uh, but that first experience of standing on a pitch, arm in arm with your teammates, belting out the national anthem, 
it's just a feeling I'll never forget. I've got goosebumps now thinking about it. And uh, to, to have had that privilege and that experience uh, is just amazing, especially, you know, home crowd, home territory as well. That was really cool. Um, and also I, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to play in the final of that competition. And so standing arm in arm in front of your teammates singing national anthem is one thing, but standing arm in arm and watching a hacker being performed opposite you is unreal. I mean, it is something I could not put into words. And I'm one of very few people on the planet who's probably lucky enough to, to have experienced that. I mean, I've never been more fired up or ready to play a game of rugby league in all my life. Uh, I remember years later um, watching a, a rugby union game, England, I think we're playing uh, New Zealand All Blacks, and Owen Farrell was in that line with his teammates watching a hacker, and the look on his face just transformed me right back to, to, the, to being there and seeing it myself. I knew exactly what was going through his mind um, and the emotions and the energy going through him, because, yeah, it was just amazing. Um, I think we... Uh, so I played in the, the semi-final uh, briefly um, as a substitute. Uh, I think it was at Castleford when we played Australia. We won the tightest of ridiculously tight games to get into the final. That was an amazing sort of experience to be around that, to have the euphoria of, of, of getting through such an amazingly competitive game. The grit and determination there was just unreal. And then we got into the final and we were playing the best team in the world at the time, uh, the New Zealand Kiwi Ferns. And I remember Simon Worth not gathering us together. So he yeah, must have been there at that time. <laughs> My memory does fail a little bit. And saying, uh, uh, recounting how when the Sheffield Eagles got to Challenge Cup final against Wigan and saying, well, we got there, but then all of a sudden it's not good enough to make it to the final. We didn't enter this competition to make it to the final. We made it to this competition to win. And I think that gave us such an amazing mindset when we went into that game. And we fought so, so well for so long of the game. There was just a really small period of time um, where we'd let in a couple of scores, um, which sort of sealed our fate. But I played the whole of the second half of that game. I came on at half time, I think. And we held them 6-4 in the second half, the whole of the second half. And that just showed what grit and determination we women from Great Britain have. We were the smallest team by a long way. I mean, I always think it's kind of cheating when you're big and strong and fast. As a British woman, that's cheating. Um, you can be big and strong or you can be fast, but that's cheating being both. And that was Kiwi Ferns all over. They were just, wow, an amazing team. But we stood toe to toe with them. We hit them tackle for tackle we did not let them get through you know six four in the second half and I know that everyone who came to see that game for some of them it was the first time they'd ever seen women's rugby league and overwhelming that overwhelmingly the response was oh my god I didn't we realize women hit like that I didn't realize they were that skillful that was an amazing game of rugby league that's fantastic you know not no gender no men no women no, not for women just that was a great game of rugby league um and yeah, so it was, it was just amazing. Uh, I mean, that's the on-field stuff. The, the off-field stuff is actually some of the stuff I remember more because I guess some of those sort of life lessons sort of stick with you. Um, so I remember uh, we obviously did lots of team building things of 30 women in a camp, even on home soil where you can occasionally see your friends. It's still, you know, uh, difficult to manage, shall we say, occasionally when there's lots of things going on. Um, and so we had lots of built-in team building activities and we'd broken up into small teams and our teams had lost and, and we had to do a forfeit. Unfortunately, when our team of sort of six or so people did a forfeit, I was at physiotherapy, so I missed the forfeit. So I came back in and it's like, Sam, you missed the forfeit. You must now do your own forfeit on your own. And it's like, this is a team, this is what we do. Okay, this I'll take one for the team. What do I need to do? And unbeknownst to me, they'd found a group of uh, guys who'd been um, on a business uh, week, uh, weekend or a few days, and one of them had got stuck in a lift for like an hour. And so between the two groups, they decided that the guy that got stuck in the lift and, and me for missing the forfeit had to stand in the reception of the hotel that we were staying at, wearing these crazy ridiculous scrum hats that we'd been given, and belt out the national anthem to any unsuspecting passers-by. 
Now, as a 19, 20 year old microbiology student uh, from Rotherham, there are one or two ways you can treat that first tour as well. Um, and I thought, well, I can either shy away and I can, you know, wait for the ground to open up and swallow me whole and mumble my way through, or I can lean into it and I can belt that national anthem out as if I'm standing opposite the Kiwi ferns. And that's exactly what I did. And shocked a lot of people in, in the uh, reception who didn't even know what was going on. And uh, me and this random guy who I've never met before just belted out the national anthem top of our voices, wearing scrum hats like you do in the middle of uh, the reception at Oral Hotel. Um, because that's what a team is. That's what a team does. And I think that's one of the first things I remember. Obviously, there's always the context of the, the games and, and the teamwork there, but being part of a squad, you know, lightening the mood, all my teammates, I tell you now, were laughing their heads off at me. Um, but that's great because it raised the spirits. Everyone enjoyed it. And it was a, you know, a fun memory. And I think that really sort of one of the first times I sort of thought to myself, yeah, don't worry about what people think. Go and do what you want to do or not want to do in this case. But yeah, go and do what you want to do um, and enjoy it. So that was, yeah, just a, <laughs> a, a, a nice bit of sort of fun that we had. Oh, uh, wow. Well, that's many. brilliant. It is one of many. I know. And I've heard some of the stories and that that's just a lovely story and simple, isn't it? And also yeah. not harmful either. It's just about, you know, bonding the team together, as, as yeah. you say. So can you remember much about the 2002 then? So when you got yeah, your recall up because it wasn't long, was it, before you eventually went on tour again? No, well, this was, it was quite an intensive period. I mean, it was November 2000 for the World Series. And then we went out, I think, in, was it July for the 2002 tour to Australia? And then we played in the World Cup in 2003, the following year, because I know there was some debate about whether we should go on tour, because again, we were raising our own funds. So we had to raise funds to go to the other side of the world to do the Australia tour, and then raise funds again to do exactly the same thing to New Zealand for the World Cup the year after. But we, you know, we cut corners where we could you know we used the same uh suits that we'd used for the 2000 tour so we didn't have to buy suits um and we doubled our efforts with bucket collections and and uh, we all upped our individual con contributions as well um so again i after the 2000 uh world series i got my letter that i was back into the training squad for 2002 tour and subsequently got my letter that i was in made the touring uh, squad as well which again was different because now we're going to the other side of the world. This is not, we're going to go to a, a hotel in Oral for a month. We're going to go to the other side of the world. This is, you know, 30 women and a few very brave men um, are going to go off to Australia. We, we were touring Australia, so we went to a few different areas in Sydney, sort of Canberra, I think it was Brisbane as well. Um, and that presented a lot more challenges, different challenges. You know, people were homesick. Um, you have to deal with, you know, people getting injured and, and uh, you know, if games don't go your way and you're with that group of people and only that group of people and there's no sort of outlet from that. Um, you know, we, we put up a hard fight. Um, we, we lost the, the, um, the series 2-1, I think it was. Um, but again, we, uh, we showed a lot of grit and determination. Um, and played, you know, really well. I was uh, really fortunate to be uh, named as, as captain for one of the, the warm-up games against Canberra. Um, so that's, you know, something that will always stay with me. I've captained the Great Britain Lionesses, even if it was only for the one game. Um, and that was uh, a really great experience. Until the point after the game that they asked the captains up to say a few words. <laughs> oh, really? Because it's like my first time, you know, they're the squad captains. Me, really? Um, but... Yeah, again, got up and I did it. I'm sure I was stumbling over words and really nervous, but uh, I got through it. Um, and I was presented with a, a shirt that I still have um, commemorating the match as well, which was really special. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the some of the off-field things I remember. So one of the things we used to do was kangaroo court. And uh, I remember, again, this is a lighthearted way of, of team building and, and re relieving tensions in, in the group. And so basically you had time to make your uh, accusations, see people you wanted to bring into the court. And then um, those people were notified of the offense that they'd committed and had time to mount a defense. They could build a team to defend them. And the one that I always remember was one of our coaches uh, charged Jane Banks with being too tall. 
and she's our second one of our second rows at the time um and uh, so her and a few friends just brought this brilliant story to life in the kangaroo court about she'd actually had a really traumatic experience as a child where she'd been stretched by an escalator and actually it was you know a very harrowing experience and she was really upset that he'd brought it up and that she had to relive this whole harrowing completely made up experience and actually the judges find the coach for putting her through that uh, mental trauma so not only did she get off she also then uh, managed to to uh, get the uh, the coach into trouble as well <laughs> it was a, a great um experience and another example of, sort of that that team building mm. i remember um when we were in canberra i think it was uh we were in these sort of little mobile home type apartments um dotted around this big piece of land and i always remember sort of i was in the uh, like a pull-out sofa bed type thing in the, the living room and uh, Lisa Mack was one of the senior people in our, our little house and she was in the bedroom and all I would hear in the morning was Sam Bailey cup of tea and that was my cue to go and uh, put the kettle on and uh, get a cup of tea for, for Lisa in the morning. Uh, incidentally that apparently is my entire rugby league name is Sam Bailey it's one word uh, Sam Bailey and that's always stuck with me even when I see people today uh, and obviously I've got married now and, and I'm Samantha McLean, Sam Bailey, that's still what they call me. So that's... <laughs> Sam Bailey cup of tea by the sound Sam of Bailey it. Sam Bailey cup of tea is usually what Lisa would shout at me, yeah. <laughs> um, another interesting one just from, from that area in Canberra was, I remember once we'd been for some food and we were walking back, or I was walking back uh, on my own, it was a little bit dark. And I walked around the corner of one of these sort of uh, terrapins, I'd call them little mobile houses, right into the face of a kangaroo which was oh, just wow. eating some food on the floor. And I was about that far away from the kangaroo and I stopped dead in my tracks and it stood up to its full height. And I was like, my, I didn't realize how tall kangaroos were up close. And I looked at the kangaroo and the kangaroo looked at me and I said, I'll, I'll go the other way. And just like hightailed it around the corner. I was like, I'm not going to get into a fight with a kangaroo. <laughs> Probably really wise because they're quite dangerous, aren't they? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> But yes, yeah, so lots of great memories of, of 2002, um, even though, you know, perhaps the result wasn't quite what we wanted, but uh, still lots of learning experiences and, and important learning for the World Cup as well. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a bit more about the World Cup and obviously that then selection for an, a, a World Cup, which the 2002 was classed as a World Series, wasn't it? And then we've got this actual World Cup. How many teams are in that World Cup? Can you remember? Oh, I don't, don't know off the top of my head, but there were maybe... At least around sort of seven or so, maybe. Yeah, seven like or eight, I think. Number, on yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, many of the um, sort of islands, Cook Islands, Samoa, uh, Tonga, put teams in. Um, so again, that was, uh, I found out after the 2002 tour that I'd been selected into the training squad for 2003 World Cup preparation. And again, received my letter through the post uh, to uh, tell me that I'd been selected to to go to World Cup in Auckland um, and again that was that was massive it was you know a really big sort of first big World Cup obviously there were only three of us in, in the World Series 2000 uh, so then to, to expand it to have all these other nations there was really really great um, again an amazing experience going out there opening game standing with my teammates uh, and you know singing the national anthem playing in that game it was it was a really great uh, time as well and, and lots of learning experiences again um i know that uh, again we had downtime so we went to a place i think it's the waitomo caves which is near auckland oh, yeah. and uh, we went to do the, the tubing i think it is on the river uh, that are underground in caves and so a few of us uh, went to do that like a group of us as one of our off day activities and uh, so we all had sort of little like wetsuits on and boots and hard hats and a torch and you got this big rubber ring and you all had to link sort of your um someone else's ankles on your arms and so you made a big sort of train as you went down this underground river and at a certain point we were told to turn the lights off so we could see the glow worms on the ceiling which was really cool until we stopped and, we, and i sort of said i think it was rennie who's behind me um at the time i said rennie why have we stopped um, I don't know. It's like, should, should we turn our lights on? Because I'm not sure what's happening. We're not supposed to stop. This is a river. And someone further down the train had let go of the person's ankles and we drifted into a little alcove. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and we were like, um, I guess we should backpedal now quite quickly and try and get back to the main group. And so we did that. 
luckily we found the group and we did make it back to the World Cup in one piece. Uh, although I've never enjoyed hot soup and bagels as much as I did after coming out of those caves because it's pretty cold down there. But again, another great sort of uh, team building experience, um, which was really cool. Yeah, yeah. So is there anything particular about the Well series you can remember about the games? I think um, it was an interesting uh, sort of time because in, in the World Cup, because we had a lot more games, because now we were in groups and, and uh, things like that, it wasn't just a Tri-Nations event. Uh, the, the coaches had to be more um, strategic in, in who they played and when. And so some of the games we went into, um, we had very different look squads, what we're used to, you know, and it's a three test match series, you get the best 17 out every single time. Whereas obviously we had to be strategic and make sure if anyone had a niggle that they rested or if um, to rotate players, you know, we had a good, strong strength in depth squad. Um, so that was interesting because we sort of had different groups of people playing at different times. It was also really interesting just seeing the different cultures as well from the, the island nations um, and, and having fun with them after the games as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they sort of had sort of traditional dress and, and things like that as well that they, they wore, which was really nice to see some of their culture. Um, I think we, you know, we battled very hard in that World Cup. Um, again, it was the first sort of big tournament. And again, I would say we were probably the smallest, physically smallest nation, although we had, you know, worked hard on our physicality and on our strengths and size. There's only so much you can do uh, in a training program when you don't quite have the Islanders genetics, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I fully understand that. <laughs> fully understand that. So, what do you think is the most challenging part of your international career? I think, in terms of uh, challenging, obviously, um, when I went into World Series 2000, I was studying a degree in microbiology. I had to take three weeks out of the term to actually go. Um, so, I had to get special uh, dispensation from the university to actually take that time out of the university. Uh, so balancing my studies as a, a young athlete um, with career aspirations and also sort of the elite level uh, high performance um, athletic training as well, uh, which was obviously club rugby training twice a week and games at the weekend, plus all the training sessions, you know, at least three, maybe four weightlifting sessions, plus your track sessions, plus your weekends and, and GB training days and things like that. Was, was a lot to manage um, around studying as well. Um, I think for the 2002 uh, tour to Australia, I was studying for my final exams about a month before, two months before we left for that tour. So it was like the build up to a, a tour and the build up to my final exams for my degree. Um, I actually missed a job interview because uh, I was touring in Australia, but I'll be honest, that's probably the best reason I've ever had for missing a job interview. It's like, oh, I can't, can't go to that interview. I'm in Australia playing rugby league for my country. Um, fair enough, you know. Um, <laughs> and I actually was told that uh, the job I did subsequently get a technical role in microbiology. One of the reasons my CV jumped out at them amongst a big pile of CVs was because I had Great Britain Lioness on my CV. And they were like, well, we want to meet this woman. So we're putting that in the interview pile. And then I got the job. So, you know, pros and cons. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just that managing, you know, the the high performance athlete side of things and then what you have else going on in your life. And for me at the time, it was studying um, for my degree. Mm. So what tell us a bit about the positive then about having an international career and reflecting back really on on what you've achieved? Yeah, I think um, I mean, so many positives. I mean, I captained the Great Britain Lionesses for a game massive you know uh, achievement for me um i competed in a, a world cup final essentially um the world series technically world cup final which there are few, very few people have ever done um and i met people from all walks of life that i would never have met in a million years um had it not been for this wonderful sport of rugby league uh and you know made some amazing friends and again from just all different experiences and walks of life um, but the main thing for me, the main positive I take out of, of, sort of being a Great Britain Lioness is how it shaped me mentally going forward and throughout the rest of my life, because that determination, that willingness to do something when you don't really want to, but you know it's for the good of either the team or yourself, 
uh, put yourself into those scary positions, work hard, be committed to a goal, you know, uh, triumphing in the face of adversity, accepting knockbacks and keep moving forward. That's all come from my time as a rugby league player from when I was young, from being a Great Britain Lioness, from going on tour, going to the other side of the world with 30 women um, and having to deal with the, the whole remit of, of emotions on the spectrum, I think. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's given me an outlook in life that I think served me really, really well, both academically, um, you're getting my PhD, um, now a senior lecturer and run a research group um, in a completely different subject, obviously, to sports, uh, but then also uh, in the future sports that I, I went on to do after my playing days were over. So that's the main thing for me, I'd say. Yeah, and tell us a bit about that. So what's next? Um, just tell us a bit about because we can't go amiss without hearing the, from the <laughs> Great Britain's strongest woman. <laughs> and where it sort of took you with that. Yeah, uh, so I, I stopped playing uh, rugby league to, uh, or retired at the ripe old age of 29 to um, sort of start a family. And then after, after having the children, it was kind of, it was just too difficult to fit the training in. And I'd played rugby actually for a long time then around sort of 15 years. Um, so I moved on to something different. And initially it was uh, obstacle races. So I enjoyed the getting muddy aspect maybe from my rugby playing days um but then I started to get fed up of all the running because it was all this running and I'm, I'm not built for running um I always enjoyed the strength aspects of rugby I enjoyed you know the programs that Simon uh prepared for us and doing the weights so I naturally gravitated towards strength sports um and the local gym that I went to uh, they had a lot of power lifters they're bodybuilders and they had um strong men and so they said, Sam, why don't you give strong, strong woman a go uh, and go and enter a competition? So I went and entered uh, a local competition. And I won that. Um, and then, yeah, I just fell in love with it straight away, I guess. I got stronger and stronger, got more used to the events. Um, and then uh, last year, it was just a crazy year for me. I didn't actually expect any of, of what happened. But yeah, I, uh, I won the Great Britain Strongest Woman competition in the Masters category. So there are four categories of Great Britain Strongest Woman. And I won the Masters category, uh, beating some really impressive women along the way through consistency and through determination, I think, um, and through a little bit of smarts, which again, all things I picked up from rugby. Um, I always say to, to my husband, uh, I know when I go into a competition in Strong Woman, no one will beat me mentally because I know how to play the game. I know how uh, to let something go if it doesn't go my way. I know how to build up, I know how to relax because all of those things you have to do when you're touring, when you've got, a, you've got a game in the evening and you've got all day to build up to it, you'd be a nervous wreck if you sort of built up from the first moment you woke up. Um, so a lot of that came through into my strong woman, I think gave me a lot of the success that I've had there. And then in November, um, I qualified to go out into the World Strongest Woman competition and uh, I was I was aiming just to go out for the first experience. I'd never been to, to this competition, but you know, the chance to represent my country for a second time in a different sport was was too much to pass up. So I went out there and I made the final, uh, which was top ten. And then uh, I actually finished seventh, which was amazing. I got to carry a Volkswagen Beetle on my shoulders for twenty meters do lots of other crazy things uh, to boot and, you know, had a really great time. So I'm really sort of enjoying that. I'm currently preparing for the, the new season. Um, so I've got England's Strongest Woman in May and then Britain's Strongest Woman defending my title in July. Oh, how exciting. If anyone hasn't seen that Beetle carry, they need to get onto <laughs> your Facebook. It's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> you just, cool. you just cane everyone around. It's brilliant. <laughs> it worked really well. Yeah. So, so it's really made a difference to you personally. But what about Women's Rugby League now? I mean, do you keep an eye on that and where it is? And what would you say to the present players and the future players of the sport about Rugby League yeah. and, and where it can take them? I think, to be honest, um, I do try and keep an eye on it. It's good to see. And I've still got friends who are playing or have moved on to coaching. Um, and uh, yeah, the sport's grown leaps and bounds. You know, the, the support now uh, is much better than it used to be. As I say, gone are the days of bucket collections um, and things like that. Um, but to any sort of it, current players new uh, or future players, I think, you know, recognise where you are, especially those who make it to the national team and recognise what you can take from that. It's not just about 
going and playing on the pitch, which is obviously massively important, but it's what you bring through from that, the things that you learn, the resilience, the skills, um, the teammates you have, the friends that you'll have for life through this um, is what really sort of I found that is what I've taken forward through the years. I mean, 2000 was a few years ago now, uh, as I realized 22 years ago. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I really remember. It's, it's the, the friends, it's, it's the life lessons that I learned um, being part of that squad. Um, I mean, I've got two young daughters myself and they're seven and 11 and I want to be a role model to them. You know, I love telling them about the time when I was a Great Britain Lioness. Um, to show them the hard work and the determination. And if you've got hard work and determination, that's what will get you what you want to do in life. That's what, what will get you where you need to go. You know, they always say, you know, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. And I have seen that time and time again, both in rugby league and uh, in other um, sort of endeavors that I've had, put in the work and you will get, you know, what you want. I was never the most talented rugby league player. I wasn't the most naturally talented, but I was, uh, persistent. I, I was like the dandelion growing through concrete. Um, I would just keep working and keep working and keep working. And that's how I got the success that I've had. Um, and I would like to show that to any young athletes out there. Um, and also to my own daughters. I mean, my, my eldest is 11. She's currently, uh, she's, she loves weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, and she's the current British and English age group championship champion. Uh, for her age and, and weight category and my seven-year-old is one of the youngest to ever be invited to the city of sheffield swim squad so they are definitely following in my footsteps and not through me being pushy they just really they see what i do and they see um you know what the experiences i've had and they want that for themselves which is just amazing to see oh sam thank you i could talk to you for hours and hours but unfortunately i um, we have to finish now. You are a true inspiration and thank you for being involved, one in this project, which is the Lioness, but actually for going out there and achieving and succeeding and, and setting the path for, for the future generations. Um, uh, you're a true inspirational and thank inspiration. So thank you very much.